Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with www.learnvisualstudio.net and in this lesson we're going to add more controls to our repertoire and we'll do it exactly like we did the previous time where we uh, copied in some XAML, talked about the control, showed you how to access the values of that control and so on. So let's begin by getting our example started off. You can see that I created a new project called Control Example Part 2 and uh, I'm going to replace the grid with one that I had uh, on my clipboard. This will create a number of row definitions and two column definitions. And inside of here we're going to uh, begin to copy and paste some XAML for the various controls that we'll cover. We're going to start by talking about controls that allow user input for times and dates. And so the first control that I want to call your attention to is the time picker. This would allow a user to select an hour uh, and a minute for uh, your application. So say I want a reminder at 9.30 p.m. This would allow your user to easily select that whether with touch or with mouse. So the most interesting property, I believe, is this clock identifier property. It comes in uh, with two potential values, either a 12-hour clock that will allow the user to select AM, PM, or a 24-hour clock, which in the United States is known as military time. So I'm going to choose the 12-hour clock, and then let's go ahead and run the application. And you can see that currently, as I'm recording, it's 4.07 p.m. Uh, as I select the control itself, it shows a nice pop-up that would look good in a mobile device as well as a desktop. And here I can select different times and choose AM, PM, and then click the check mark for acceptance or the X to cancel. All right, and you can see my selections now are displayed in the controls body as well. Very nice. The next control that I want to talk about uh, relates to dates, and there are actually two of these. The first one is what's called a calendar date picker. And so when you hear the term picker, typically you're going to see a flyout up here. In other words, uh, you're not going to see the entire body of the control. You'll just see a little part of the control. You click on that control and it will show you more items to choose from. In this case, you'll see a calendar pop up. So uh, let's go ahead and run the application as is, and then we'll talk about some of its special properties. So here you can see that uh, we get this little control with select a date, a little date or calendar icon off to the right hand side. And when I select it, you can see that uh, we get a nice calendar here. Today is selected by default. I can move up and down in months. I can choose different dates and when I do notice that it makes that selection and puts it into the uh, to the visible area of that calendar picker. Now if you take a look here over on the uh, let me get this off here. If you take a look off here on the right hand side in the properties area you can see that there are a number of interesting properties like the type of calendar that we're going to use. By default in the United States it's set to Gregorian calendar however you can see that there are many different uh, types of calendars for various Asian countries. Uh, there's a Hebrew calendar and others as well. Okay. Is today highlighted? That's interesting. It's by default selected. You can change the placeholder text and I'll just go ahead and change that to choose a date and we'll see that the next time we run. Uh, and there might be some other interesting little, uh, little things here, but I think that's probably the majority of the interesting things to look at with the calendar date picker. Now the other type of calendar control is actually just called the calendar view. And when you hear the word view, typically uh, in XAML controls it means that it's going to be displayed all the time. So in this case we have a calendar view control. I'm going to, you can see that I have a selected date changed event handler. So let me go ahead and just create that event handler by putting my mouse cursor on that word and then hitting F12 on the keyboard. That should satisfy for now. We'll come back to and add some code to that in just a moment. Notice here that we can make multiple selections in the calendar uh, instead of just one. Let's see what the other values are. So no selection, a single date selection, or multiple date selection. Let's leave it at multiples and then run the application. And so you can see today is highlighted by default. Uh, I can make various selections and notice that every time I make a selection it highlights that date. Okay. Notice how much space this actually takes up in our application as well. Now let's 
actually handle the selected date changed. And you can see here that I've added a text block called calendar view result text block. And what I want to do inside of that is add all the selected dates uh, so that we can see them. Now, to get to the selected dates, we'll go into the selected date changed event handler. And I'm going to copy in some code here and explain what it does. Um, so, you might think that what I do here is a little bit roundabout, but I'm going to explain why we do all this. Let me move this over to the side here. All right, so what I want to do is get a list of the selected dates. So, uh, the sender is of type calendar view. So we're going to say, give me all the selected dates for that calendar control. Then we're going to select a, and make sure that we're choosing or projecting out of those selections the month slash day. So this is a, pro, the select statement is a projection statement in link. And we're just choosing the data that we want to spit out or emit from that statement. So we're getting all the selected dates, but just give me the date slash day as a string. And then I want it, all those dates to be added to an array. So I call the to array in the very end of that. So now we have an array of strings called selected dates. And the reason I put them in an array is so that I can call the string.join method and separate each of them with a comma. Uh, and you'll see the effect in just a moment. Now that we have our joined string, we can set it as the text property to that text block that I added. So let's see how this works. All right, so now I'm going to start selecting some dates. And as I select them, notice that they show up uh, as the month slash day, and they're separated by commas. All right, so hopefully that little snippet of code will help you to work with multiple date selection. All right, so that's enough with dates and times. Let's move on and talk about the next thing, which is going to be a flyout control. And there's two different um, flyout buttons that we're going to look at. The first one will just pop open a little message box for us here. So you can see that, uh, actually, let me do this. Let me put my mouse cursor in that click, um, that click event handler, enter flyout button click, hit F12 on my keyboard, that'll create the event handler stub, which we'll come back to in just a moment. And what we'll do is you can see that many of the controls actually, in this case, the button control has a flyout property. And what you can put inside of that flyout property is either a flyout or a flyout menu, like we'll look at in just a moment. And inside of that flyout, we can add any controls that we want. In this case, I'm going to create a stack panel and add a text block and a button. And here I'm just going to put out some text inside of that little dialog that I'm creating kind of manually. Uh, and so then when somebody clicks the button, what we want to do is actually hide that flyout again. So let me go ahead and hit F12 again with my mouse cursor selected on that name. And I'm going to um, add some code that will actually hide the flyout so that when we click the OK button, that flyout will hide. Now you might be still wondering, well, what does this do? I don't even know what a flyout is. Well, here you'll see it's real simple. Here's my little flyout button. It could be many different controls, but in this case, we're choosing a button. And when I click it, you can see that there is a little, uh, little dialog box that I created with a little message. And when I click the OK button, it hides. All right. So that's one style of flyout. Let's take a look at now a flyout menu. And you've probably seen these if you've worked uh, inside of um, inside of Windows 10 or inside of the uh, Windows 10 uh, on the phone and this will uh, often be useful whenever you're trying to create a contextual menu for a given control in this case again I'm only going to use a button but you'll see that many different controls have a flyout property a complex property that we can add this menu fly out. We can also state where we want this placed. Here in this case, I'm saying put it to the bottom, but we can set it to the left, the right, the top, or make it full screen. Let's go um, bottom again. So we want it below whatever, if, if possible, put the menu below the button. Next up, we're going to create a series of fly out or menu fly out items. And each of these could have a, uh, a click event that we can handle but I'm not at the moment. 
Here's a flyout separator, so a little line that will make sections inside of our context menu that we created. Here we're creating a menu flyout sub item. So this will allow us to create kind of a, a hierarchical menu. So inside of that item three, when we click it, we'll see item four, item five. Item five is another sub item menu flyout, which has item six and item seven. All right, and then also at the very bottom, you'll see that I have a toggle menu flyout item, and this is useful whenever you want to turn something on and off and, and show that a selection has been made with a little, uh, a little uh, check mark in the left hand corner. Okay, so let's go ahead and run the application. And um, unfortunately, we can't see it there but I'm gonna go ahead and click it now I said put it to the bottom however there wasn't enough space below it so in this case it put it above it but notice I have two items and then a separator then I have item 3 which gives me a sub menu and item 5 which even gives me an additional sub menu and then with item 8 I selected it and now the next time I look at it, it has a check mark next to it so now it's on now it's off okay so this is useful for contextual menus again I want to emphasize that I'm using a button in this case, but we can use many different controls that have this flyout property where we can add uh, a contextual menu or just dialogue as a result of clicking on that item or interacting with it in some way. All right, so the next item that I want to take a look at is the auto suggest box. And this will become very helpful to us whenever we're building real applications that include the search feature, like the hamburger style navigation that we've seen up to this point. Here again, so that the application compiles, I'm going to put my mouse cursor on the, uh, this little uh, text changed event handler, uh, and then hit F12 on my keyboard just to create the stub and my code behind. And then coming back here to the main page, you can see that I, uh, I have a number of interesting properties here, like the placeholder text. So we're going to say search or find something, maybe something like this, so that this is very distinctive, right? We can set also the query icon. Let's see what our options are there. All right, so there are a number of different icons that we can choose from. But in our case, let's just go back to the uh, to the find icon. Now let's run the application. Now what it will do by itself, well, there's not a whole lot that it'll do, honestly. Unfortunately, let's move that up a little bit. So I can start typing in here and nothing really happens. And you might think, well, this is not very uh, interesting. The reason this becomes interesting as I close this down is what you can do it with it to filter results. So let's go back over here into the code behind and at the very top what I want to do is copy in a new array of strings that I'm calling um, selection items and you can see that this is just a list of names and some of them start with the letter F, some of them start with the letters FR, FR, uh, some of them start with the letter T, TA, TO, okay. And we're going to see how we narrow down that selection as we type, as the text is changing in that auto suggest box. Now, we don't get that, the, that functionality automatically. We're going to have to add some code. So I'm pasting in some additional code here. The sender is an auto suggest box. So I'm just getting a reference to it here in this line number 48. In line number 49, here I'm going to do a WHERE clause on that array of strings, that selection items that I pasted in up here. So we're going to filter that list by looking for items that start with whatever text was typed into the auto suggest box. Then we'll call to array on it and we'll use that filtered box and pass it to the item source of our auto suggest box. So now that source will be uh, you'll see a little menu pop up with all the filtered items that we can choose from. So let's go ahead and, and run the application. All right, so this time I'm going to type in the letter F, and as you can see, when I do that, uh, I get a number of options. And then I can use the up and down arrow to actually select one of the two. So uh, as I select it, then it removes all the other options. All right, so let's try that with T, T, A. T-A-N, T-A-N-Y, and then I can use the down arrow and then hit enter on my keyboard. It makes that selection. So the auto suggest 
uh, suggest box very helpful especially for a search feature that we'll be adding to our applications all right so let's go on to the next one I want to talk about the slider control and the slider uh, would you'll see this often used in Windows 10 um, it will allow the user to make a selection here we're gonna make allow them to make a maximum selection of 100 and a minimum selection of 0 so when we run the application you can see that there's this little slider control and it even has the number above it we can control the increments uh, and whether or not to display that little thing on the top uh, but you'll see this often used in Windows 10 we're going to use it too in our applications the next thing I want to show that kind of goes along with it is a uh, here I'm going to copy some of it but not all of it just yet To talk about a progress bar and a progress bar will give feedback to the user for long-running operations so in this particular case um, I can set the value equal to like uh, 57 so the maximum will be a hundred but I'm gonna hard code this value to 57 so let's run the application and you can see that uh, we're 57 percent of the way through our progress now this isn't very interesting to set it statically like that um, ideally you would be setting it through some code behind operation during the long running operation but let me show you something really neat and let me just paste it in and then I'll explain what it does in just a moment here I'm going to remove this value equals 57 and replace it with this strange syntax and then let's run the application and I'll show you what it does so what I've done is I have bound the current value of the progress bar to whatever the value of the slider is so notice as I move the slider notice that I'm also moving the progress bar okay so we're binding data binding and the binding statement there's a new binding statement new to uh, to the universal windows platform and we'll talk about this in an upcoming lesson uh, however what we can do is say hey you know that slider that control called my slider that I named up here I want you to grab its value and bind to it now this will be a one-way binding meaning that if I make any changes to the progress bar it will not reflect back to the slider it's one way any changes of the slider will affect the progress bar but not vice versa okay there's also other modes we'll talk about those later but this is just one of the kinds of things that you can do with binding in XAML it's a very powerful feature that we'll be harnessing frequently throughout the remainder of this series and then I guess the last thing that I want to talk about is the progress ring another type of progress this doesn't give the user any um, specific feedback on how far we are through the process it's merely just displaying the fact that uh, that something is in operation or that something's going on uh, and it's ongoing you see it's just a little ring it just goes around and around and around until we tell it to stop and so there's a, a method that allows us to start and a method that would allow us to stop uh, or actually a property is active true or is active equals false okay all right so hopefully you can see how these controls could be useful when building real applications whether they work with dates whether we need some contextual menus or uh, some some dialogues to to pop up to notify the user of something to ask for ask for some input uh, we also looked at um, the auto suggest box which will be huge when we create our own search functionality in that hamburger style navigation we looked at the slider control which is used frequently in Windows 10 especially in the uh, the settings uh, window and then finally um, uh, the progress bar and the progress ring okay so uh, great more tools under our under our belt more tools in our toolbox that we can use to build more powerful applications. Let's continue on. Keep building on this. We'll see you in the next lesson. Thank you.